What is going on, internet family? So I got a great surprise for you guys. And I wish someone would have told me this. Um, and I believe within a believer's six months of them becoming a Christian, they need to know that there is spiritual warfare because you are no longer on the devil's side. You are following the opposite of him. And he's going to try to take that from you. So you can't let him. And so today I'm going to break this up into two parts where you're going to be discussing the armor of God. Okay, let's get to it. Okay. So the powerful thing about the armor of God is that this topic is kind of exciting and encouraging if you let it be. So think for a second about the name armor of God. Just let, let it sink in. It's the name armor of God. Like God gives you his personal armor not some angel's armor not your own armor that you can build spiritually no god gives you his personal armor and if we see in first samuel 17 32 through 40 that david was kind of in this same type of situation where um before he was going to fight goliath everyone told david that he could not be this philistine but David was very bold and yet very young. And as we all should be when the enemy taunts us and tries to speak to us. So David was speaking to King Saul and Saul was trying to deter David like, hey, you sure you want to do this, man? And David was like, yeah, he's taunting our God. I'm, I'm going to go beat this dude up. What are you talking about? I'm going to slay him for our God. And so Saul was like, okay, if you're going to do this, at least take my armor. And so picture this, a teenager wearing an old seasoned veteran's armor, probably all clunky, heavy. They was like, I don't want this, man. Take this off of me. I ain't used to this. I've, I've slain bears and lions. Remember during that time, those animals probably ate really good compared to their just now. So these animals were probably bigger and stronger, and yet David killed them with his hands without any type of armor because he knew who his God was. And so Saul agreed, you don't need armor, okay. He went out there and slayed that giant because he knew who his God was and he had God's armor on. He didn't need a man's armor. So this leads us to Ephesians where we see the armor of God, verses six, chapters 10 through 17. Well, let's read it, okay? But first, we're all just gonna go to break down Ephesians chapter six. 10 through 13 and in part 2 we'll finish verses 14 through 17 this is what it says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood that should ring for some of you guys but against principality against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Hmm, so good. So let's break down verse 10. When you see the word finally in the Bible anywhere, it's just summarizing what was previously said. And so, what I want you guys to do, if you're seeing this, go read the book of Ephesians, chapters 1 all the way through 6, so you get a more clear summary of what I'm going to be discussing here and why Paul takes says take up this armor. Um, and so, verse 10, we are called to be strong, which is essential in spiritual warfare, because God's might, we are able to even be strong in the first place. We must first be strong in the Lord in order to go further into our spiritual battle. We can only attain this strength from God through his power and his might, and we cannot do it on our own. We just can't. I've tried. Don't try it on your own because you can't fight an unseen enemy by yourself. Now, the word might means power or force. And the power means exercising that might, like putting the might into practice to show your might, such as if I'm bending the metal bar, I'm using power to show my might. And so we do not work, we rely on God's power and might to do the work for us. For instance, 
I pray for the Lord to attack the enemy on my behalf because I can't do it in my own strength. So Lord, give me your strength while in return you are already attacking them in Jesus' name. Mm, so good. So verse 11, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. We see that in this verse, Paul did not ask us to put on the armor. It is a command to put on an armor. He didn't say, if you want to put on, he said simply, straight up to the point, put on the armor of God. So not only that, he said, put on the whole, capitalize those letters, W-H-O-L-E, put on the whole armor of God, not just a piece. Don't just put on the helmet or the belt, put on the entire set. This armor is all we need in our spiritual battle against the enemy. Because each piece breaks up its individual thing, which if you guys stay tuned for part two, I'm going to break up in mighty ways with each piece me. And so, if you even miss one piece of armor on your body, you are vulnerable to attack where that piece is missing. We are commanded to put on the home armor of God, okay? So we do not go into the enemy's camp without a weapon. Come on, how ridiculous does that sound? If I'm in the military and the Navy SEALs, I cannot go overseas and try to fight with no M14 or no pistol or no knife or anything. It just doesn't make biblical sense at all. And so if you are in the devil's camp, you have to know, let me say this, every day you're in the devil's camp because you're on God's side. And so you not only need to know how to defeat him, you also need to know how to cast him out of people, and you also need to know how to raise up further warriors on how to defeat them. But you have to start with yourself. Like they say in an airplane, you have to put on your mask before you put on someone else's. It also says this in Colossians 2.15. We see that Jesus stripped and defeated all, capital A, capital L, capital L. Y'all got to realize the small letters in scripture make a very big meaning. So Jesus stripped and defeated all demonic power, all satanic power, and has given us that same power. It even said that Jesus made a public spectacle, or in the ESV version, it says that Jesus put the enemy to shame. Isn't that great? The enemy. That means he stripped them of all power. He stripped them of all the weapons that they could use against us. This shows me that the enemy doesn't have anything to use against me because it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, we are more than conquerors in Jesus. Especially, man, especially if you could put on his personal armor. Man, come on now. That's good stuff. Now, we also express God's strength in us by standing against the wiles or the schemes of the enemy. So when Paul said put on, he meant to sink in the armor, to clothe yourself in God's armor. And remember that put on is a command, not an option. So we're commanded to clothe ourselves in God's armor. But also Paul says to stand, he is saying to stand firm and to be established in God. Now this word against, we also see in, in verse 11, the word against in Greek means to have an advantage over and the word wild and schemes mean deceit crafty or tricky so remember we are commanded to put on the whole armor of god to stand and be established in god and to have the advantage over the enemy's craftiness and his trickiness and this leads to verse 12 and it gets better and better verse 12 every christian should know how to fight in spiritual warfare period and I say within the first six months, because this is when the enemy is going to try to come and steal the seed like we see Jesus talking in the parable of the seed. Now, this is a fact for every Christian that the enemy is going to try to defeat you in any way possible. Just know this. I think I'm going to say this again in my notes here. But the enemy cannot stop God's plan. But he can slow it down and he can slow down the blessings that God has for you. So let's break down this verse 12 in easier terms. We don't fight other human beings. This might speak to someone here because maybe one of you keep holding someone's sins over their head. So I'm going to go back and read this verse for you. Verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities 
against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age and the spiritual host of wickedness in high places. So let's break all this down even more. We do not fight other human beings. You guys got to stop with the unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest ways I see people in deliverance do not receive freedom because they don't have chains on. They're holding on to the chain themselves. The only person that is being held captive with unforgiveness is you. And you have to know that you are not fighting against that human being that raped or molested or abused or rejected you. You are fighting against a demonic force that has used them to hurt you, to open a door in your life to let that unforgiveness spirit into you. Gotta stop with that stuff, guys. Remember, we do not fight against other human beings. There are demonic powers working behind them. So I know this speaks to someone watching this right now. We fight against the spirits that are working behind these people through the pain and the hurt that they have experienced from people before them. So if you're going to judge that person who's hurt you, you have to judge all the way back to Adam and Eve because you don't know what that person who's hurt you been through. Such as if you have daddy issues from a dad who raised you wrong and doesn't know how to treat you, look back at his father. Or his father, or his father. You have to go all the way back, and you can't pick up God's gavel and try to judge someone because God said revenge is mine. So if you are ignorant of this fact, you will lose the battle of unforgiveness and give any demon a legal right to operate in and through your life. We have too much and so much division in our churches that are not even salvation issues, and it is only because we don't remember we have a common enemy. And I love this quote. This quote rings that us as Christians need to use. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So if I'm a Baptist, I should be coming together with the Methodists to fight the devil and not each other. We have almost the same jock doctrines. We just use it differently. We all believe Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, right? Boom. That's it. Let's focus on the devil and kick his butt and step on his demon's neck. So Jesus also said this in Matthew and in Mark, that the kingdom divided cannot stand, y'all. Why do you think we see the enemy running rampant everywhere? Why do you think we see wicked millionaires and not and not millionaire Christians everywhere? Because we are so worried about whose doctrine is correct that aren't even salvation issues like should she speak in tongues or should she speak in tongues or should she preach or should she not preach? Like, come on. Stop. We're all going to get to heaven and laugh at all the stuff that we argued over. So, remember, our battle is not against flesh and blood, guys. But this also brings me to the best part of what this verse says. It tells us exactly who the enemy is and where they reign. The enemy, just like God, does and even how works how our military does here on earth. So there are different levels. There are different ranks. There are different authorities given with all with one goal, to kill, steal, and destroy us, like it says in John 10, 10. But have courage, because it says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39, that nothing can keep us from God's love in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Which further brings me, means that Satan's power is limited. Limited. Y'all give Satan too much credit. His power is limited. Jesus has full reign and authority over this guy, let alone his little minion demon. So, if we were to go read Ephesians chapter 1, it explains that Jesus is enthroned higher than these satanic and demonic powers, which you would read later if you go read Ephesians 1 by yourself. But where does the enemy live now? He lives in high places. So where does Jesus live? Jesus lives inside of us. And so if Jesus, if Jesus is enthroned in high places, and he is higher than them, and he lives in us, so we must be enthroned in higher places, which it says in other parts of the Bible. And we are higher than the demons and Satan, which it says in other parts of the Bible as well. So we are enthroned higher than the devil, just like Jesus did. It also says this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, that though us, us right here, our physical bodies, the followers of God, God should make known the wisdom of him to the principalities and powers in high places. So this is how we can make public spectacles of them as well. We have to fight back. If Jesus lives in us and he made a public spectacle of them, 
He wants to use us to also make a public spectacle of all these demons who think they have power. But also says this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, that everything, including the enemy, was made by God and for God. Remember, the devil and the demons were once angels. They were not meant to be the way they are. They were meant to be God's children and just be used like the other angels as messengers and to lift God's name up. But we all know how that went. And we also see what happened in the book of Job. God used Satan to test Job to bring Job to a higher faith and give him more blessings. So just remember in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus disarmed all the enemy at the cross. But because we are human with our human limitations, it is only because of what Jesus has done that gives us the power over all the enemy as well. So let's break down what all of this stuff means in verse 12 about the principalities and powers and where they rule. So the word wrestle means hand-to-hand combat to fight against. And principalities means beginning or first. So in the so let's break this down. Principalities, these are Satan's strongest and highest ranking demons. So in school terms, let's break this down. The principalities are, it's in the name, they're the principal of the school. The powers are mean they're the enforcers or the authoritative ones. So in school terms, this is the vice principal, the one who gives out the punishments and stuff like that. The one who enforces the rules and the punishments. Rulers are the demons that work through the higher leaders, um, like we have today, that work through the humans, such as ungodly politicians or even pastors that promote themselves and not preach the real Jesus. So I believe these are demons who work over regions, who report to the powers that are over the state, then principalities that are over the country. Let me say that again. The rulers are the demons who work over the regions who report to the powers which are over the states, and then you have the principalities who rule over certain countries. Also, the the demons that are used in spiritual wickedness are the demons that I personally believe that influence our daily lives. These are the spirits that are ignorant of God's laws. They don't care, they're already damned. They are very evil, they are depraved of life, and emerge in constant and full iniquity for eternity and want to do nothing but bring us down with it. So all of these demons rule from the first and second heaven. You can find that in the Bible as well. That's a whole separate teaching. They don't rule from hell. You got to realize the difference between the pit and the abyss and the hell, which is like a fire. The pit and the abyss is like a jail cell waiting, a waiting cell um, for those who don't know Jesus and the demons and for them to be judged later. But the hell or the lake of fire is yet to be opened until Satan is finally defeated at the end of the age, guys. There's a difference. So this means we do not fight against other humans, but we are in hand-to-hand combat, fighting every day against the entire satanic kingdom who rule from high places within us and around us. So think about this next time someone hurts you or offends you especially for preaching Jesus, because they just need to meet our Savior just like you have. This leads me to the last verse, (laughs) verse 13. Let's read it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Let's break this down. It's pretty simple. In this verse, it shows you that this is the proper response to spiritual warfare and what sums up all we discussed today. Take up the whole armor of God. This is another command. Paul didn't say, if you want to, you should take up the over of God. Not only did he say, put on, he said, take it up, which are two different meanings. It was a member, a command. So without God's armor and his strength, it is difficult to stand against the attacks of an unseen enemy. God's strength is here to help us stand against the enemy, and his armor helps us fight back. Let me say that again. God's strength is here to help us stand, to stand firm, not to move against the enemy. But his armor helps us fight back and push the devil back. Paul wants us to understand that God gives us a plan and a purpose like we see in Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I have a plan and a hope for you, not to harm you. But Satan will try everything to slow it down. Notice I said slow it down, though, like I said before. Because Satan cannot stop what God has started or close the door that God has opened. But listen here. 
only you can close and stop God's plan in your life because you have the freedom to choose it or not. God honors your choice out of abundance of love for you. And he, if you want to stop, if you don't want to do his will, then he's not going to get in your way. You know, because he loves you that much. He gave you the free will to choose, to close that door, to not follow him. That's up to you. But remember, he has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan to give you a hope in the future. So, But standing is, is important because when we stand, God gives us so much. He gives us more grace. He gives us strength and more encouragement. He gives us a lot more faith, which is where I come from. man. if y'all knew my testimony, man, I won't be anywhere without what I went through, which gave me more faith. He gives us liberty and freedom and unity and more of him and his will in our personal lives. Now, coming to a close here, we see that Paul tells us to stand because we will be attacked for being a follower of Jesus, period. There is no in between. There is no might. You will be attacked for following Jesus. But we must not be frightened, okay? Must not. No self-pity. Don't slouch in your faith and no half-heartedness in the spiritual fight because once you do that, the piece of the armor are gonna start to fall off and leave cracks with the enemy is gonna come into your life. So when we stand against the enemy, we are showing him that we are alert of his schemes, of his trickiness and his deceptiveness, and we are in position to fight him. So we give no thought of retreat or backing down to this enemy. So when Paul says to take up the whole armor of God, he is saying to raise or to use this armor that God has given you. Whole armor of God means the complete set, everything. He also says that we are capable, we are strong, and we are more powerful than we think we are in Jesus' name. So when we oppose and resist the attacks enemy and the temptations that have thrown at us, the trouble, the annoyances of our life, the hardships, and all the peril must cease. Now, it doesn't mean that it will stop, because the enemy is always going to try to bring you down in some sort of way. But that's why I love this verse, resist the devil, he will flee from you. But the first part of that verse says, submit to God. When you submit to God, he gives you his strength. So you can put on his armor to resist the devil and in return, the devil will flee. But Lord, I thank you for everyone listening. I ask that you bless them and help this word to be stored in their heart. And I love you guys in Jesus' name. Y'all come back for the armor of God part two because oof, it's even better. Love you guys. Y'all stay blessed. This is the cross of Christ.